Welcome to this wonderful event we have tonight. I'm Professor David Bilchitz. I'm a professor in the Faculty of Law and Human Rights and Constitutional Law. And I'm also the director of the South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional, Public Human Rights and International Law, known as CIFAC. Before we move into our event, I just want to mention to you that there's going to be live tweeting of this event. So if you wish to do so, at, on your table there are hashtags, just as a personal account, and Judge Edwin Cameron, uh, hashtag Judge Edwin Cameron. So please go ahead and tweet the event as well. And also to mention to you that the book that's going to be the subject of the event will be on sale um, in, the, in the corner with Lynn and I believe it's going to be 220 Rand. And I hope after our discussion you're going to be motivated to uh, go and buy the book. I was asked last week by the Dean to be involved in this event with Justice Edward Cameron. It is a great honour to do so. For a long time Judge Cameron has been a role model for me. He is someone who displays a deep integrity from his work in the Centre for Applied Legal Studies against the injustices of the apartheid system, to his public advocacy of gay rights, to coming out openly as a gay man, to coming out later on with his HIV status, and for his strong stance against AIDS denialism. He is also an excellent judge. As a legal academic, it is my task and role to hold, ju hold judges to account for their judgments and to criticise their reasons where they are weak. Though I may disagree on occasion with Judge Cameron, one cannot help but be impressed by the oeuvre of his judgments for their clarity, analytical perspicacity and depth of his thinking. In brief, in terms of his CV, he went to high school at Pretoria Balls High and then studied at Stellenbosch University, where he did both classics and Latin. Thereafter at Oxford, he receiving a first for a BA in jurisprudence. And so, there may be a few final year law students here, I want to emphasize the importance of studying jurisprudence. Thereafter, he got a Master's in Law, which is referred to in Oxford as a BCL. As an inspiration to all students here, I want to let you know that Justice Cameron received the Vinerium Scholarship, which honors the best student in the BCL at Oxford. A major achievement indeed from all the students around the world who did this course. He worked for many years then at the Johannesburg Bar, at the Centre for Applied Legal Studies at WITS, and was involved in the gay and lesbian movement submission to the Kempton Park negotiations for the new constitution. President Mandela appointed him as a judge of the High Court, and in 2000 he became a judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal. And since 2009 he has been a judge of the Constitutional Court. That is a very, very brief resume, but I did not want to tell you more because I'm going to hopefully engage with Justice Cameron and he's going to tell you a lot about his own remarkable life. So tonight we're actually going to do this in the style of an engagement between us, and so I'm going to ask a number of questions, Judge Cameron's going to respond, and then we're going to have a conversation, maybe sometimes a discussion, and then we're going to open it up for questions as well. So. Um, the first question I wanted to ask as I was reading the book, I sort of started thinking about like, why would I write this kind of book? So I wanted to ask Judge Cameron, what motivated you in writing the book? Thank you very much, David, and my first to say good evening to everyone. How are you? It's very beautiful to be here. It's a lovely evening. It's our second day of sunshine after three weeks of rain. So I'm very pleased to be here. And it's a great thrill for me to be a UJ particularly. Uh, I live just up the road, so I know your campus very well, and my two goddaughters are at UJ. Can I embarrass them by asking them to stand up, please? <laughs> thank you very much. So that's my family to, to UJ. But David, thank you very, very much for the very generous introduction. Um, I, and it's a good question that you started with, David, because there's a lot of personal information in the book. But the personal information in the book is not because I think I'm different from South Africans. I talk about poverty. I talk about being different. Every single one of us is different. I was talking to two of you, Lady Mash Chancellors, earlier this evening, Professor Tinyiko Manuleke and Professor Chalitza Magwala. They gave the speak the smallest linguistic group, apart from the Tonga speakers in our country. So when I talk, when I talk about poverty, when I talk about growing up in a, in a, in a difficult uh, difficult family circumstances. When I talk about stigma, most South Africans have experienced stigma. When I talk about living with HIV, uh, there's, no, there's no South African that hasn't seen the ravages that AIDS 
have, have, have inflicted on our families and our communities. So those things I mentioned, not because I think I'm different from South Africans, but because I think we've got so much in common. And through that common experience, I want to explain how important our constitution and the legal system is. That's what defines us as a country, is our extraordinary constitution. Can I ask how many more students are here this evening? I'm so proud of you, that's beautiful. Let's give us as lawyers a round of applause for ourselves. <laughs> and can you also give the long lawyers who come? Who are the long, the long lawyers? I'm even prouder of you. It's very brave of you to come. There's a physicist there. Thank you. Let's give the non lawyers a round of applause. The most distinctive feature of us as South Africans white, black, vendor speaking, English speaking, gay and straight, HIV positive, HIV negative is this extraordinary constitution. And this book is not a law book, but it's a book about the law. And it's a book about the constitution. And it explains the constitution and where it's come from. So Edwin, you, you say that it explains the constitution, but it also intertwines very much, and not only the constitution and the legal journey of the country, but your own personal journey. And I was very interested in this engagement between the personal and the political and the legal. Why did you choose in your book to, to intertwine these two facets so closely? I mean, you could have written a book which was a kind of constitutional engagement with the great jurisprudence. Uh, you could have written an autobiography, but you chose to sort of intertwine the two very much. What, what was your approach? That's a beautiful question, David. Thank you very much. And the reason is because my own life story is a political life story. Because I grew up in, in, a, in a racist country where I was privileged because I was white. And I grew up poor in a country where most whites were wealthy or at least affluent. But my white skin was my escape card from poverty. I got into Pretoria Boys High and I told the story when I was 14 years old in my second year uh, at, 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 at high school. And Pretoria Boys High led to Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch led to the Rhodes Scholarship. And those were racially exclusive institutions. So I learned in growing up, growing up in poverty, growing up hard, but growing up white, the importance of access to education, the importance of discrimination, the, the, the vicious and horrific effects of discriminating against people on irrational grounds. And then coming out as a gay man, discovering at 14 that I was homosexually oriented and wanting to fight it for 16 years of my life having straight relationships, getting married, and then realizing I cannot fight anymore with my true self. I have to accept it. There's no choice in being gay. It's an acceptance of being gay. All of those are political events. And so I think the story of my engagement with the law and my story of my engagement with my life are political. And I think that they have a political point. And all those points come together in the Constitution, which offers us each a chance to a life with dignity and equality, provided we're going to make it work. So this, this intertwining of the personal and the legal raises a number of interesting questions concerning your approach to judging. Um, and so some of you are not law students, so I'm going to put on my law lecturer hat now and tell you that there are different views in legal theory about the role that personal experience should or should not play in the way a judge operates in the world. HLA Hart, for instance, would say that a judge should not at all be influenced by their personal experiences when at least determining the core meaning of a statute. On the other end of the spectrum, critical legal studies theorists would suggest that the language of law is itself a mask for the expression of judicial ideologies, which often flow from personal predilections. And so the question I wanted to ask you, Edwin, and which was raised for me as I was going through the book, is what is your perspective on the role of personal experience in judging and adjudication? Well, I think it's unavoidable, David, especially with a constitution like ours, which is a value-laden constitution. It's a constitution that says we have to create dignity at the center of our constitution. The, the founding value is dignity and equality. And how can you give those values content without a deeply personalized understanding? It doesn't mean that I give my own personal preferences effect in, 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 in the Constitution. Uh, for example, this, this Thursday we had a very difficult case about affirmative action. So we were a, a diverse court with three white people, eight black people on the court at the moment. There are no colored or Indian people on the court. Two women, nine men. I think it's far too many men. But the point being that you take a judicial oath to interpret a 
according to the law and the Constitution. But if your conception of what the content is of the values in the Constitution is unavoidably influenced by your history, your experiences, your understanding of, 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 of life and the law. So the first chapter takes us through a range of important cases where judges actually use the existing law in some sense to undermine apartheid. Um, and so I wanted you to perhaps share with the audience, because I'd like people to get a bit of a feel and a flavor for the book, of, of one of the cases that you found particularly inspiring and perhaps were personally involved with. Well, it's, it's the most wonderful case was one that I wasn't involved in at all. It's a case that concerned President Mandela. He was a young man. He was just in his mid-30s, and he was one of the leaders of the Defiance Campaign. And the Defiance Campaign was designed to make apartheid unworkable. And it failed. As a political campaign, it didn't succeed because the apartheid ideologues and the apartheid security police and state apparatus was too powerful. But Mr. Mandela was an attorney. He'd been to Vitz. Sorry, he'd been to Vitz. <laughs> Vitz Law Graduate. But he, he, he was a lawyer. And he said to people, you must not obey the past laws, you must not obey the segregation laws, you must not obey the mixed marriage laws, you must not obey the race registration laws. And the law society said to him, you cannot be a lawyer when you are, when you are advocating defiance of the law. And they took him to court. And they said to the court, you've got to strike this man off the roll of attorneys because he's advocating disobedience of the law, he's advocating subversion of the law, which is the opposite of what a lawyer should be doing. And the court, this is 1954, the high point of the enforcement of the law of apartheid. The apartheid government had come into power six years before. And two judges, two white judges of the high court said no. They said this man is doing what he's doing for moral reasons. He's doing what he's doing because he wants to promote the interests of what the judges then call the non-Europeans. It was the polite word used by whites at that point for black people. And they refused to strike him off the roll. It's an extraordinary judgment. And that judgment was the start of a whole series of judgments that just judges, just judges gave under apartheid. Apartheid became unworkable partly because of judgments of the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein. The past laws were rendered inoperative. I describe all of this in Chapter 1, how two decisions of the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court in Wilmington in the 1980s made it impossible for the apartheid government to enforce the past laws anymore. Can I just ask a question? How many of you know what the past laws were? Who doesn't know what the past laws were? Well, do you know that every black person in an urban area had to carry a pass? And if you didn't carry a pass, you got arrested. Does it remind you of anything, by the way? Who's a non-South African? Who's a dark-skinned South African? Have you ever been at risk of being arrested and put in the back of a police van? That happened every year to hundreds of thousands of South Africans simply because they were black. It was a shameful system. And the appellate division, five white judges in the appeal court in the 1980s, put an end to the pass laws because they made it impossible to enforce them anymore through their legal rulings. So the point, David, which I think you're making is that apartheid was a, a legal system that was enforced, it was a system of oppression enforced through the law, but you could use apartheid law against itself. You could use the logic of apartheid law to undermine apartheid. And that's what lawyers like Pius Langer, Arthur Chaskelson, George Bezos, Joe Slover did, and I did it at Centre for Applied Legal Studies. The role, uh, like you say, uh, one could use the logic to undermine the law, but you also, um, you also um, focus a lot on very on positive cases that happen. And there are also many, many negative cases where Judge Rule, for example, who in one case comes out, uh, you know, in several of these cases comes out positively, but also come out negatively in many, many respects. Do you think it was justifiable to be a judge, to remain a judge in the, the apartheid judiciary? Uh, we know Justice Laurie Ackerman, in fact, found that at a certain point he had to resign from the judiciary to follow the dictates of his conscience. Do you think that was a, the only choice, or do you think that the other judges who remained also made a moral choice? That's such an interesting question, because we all have moral choices about working within or without a system. And under apartheid, the apartheid system still offered people who were opposed to apartheid enough room to believe that they could make a moral contribution towards undermining apartheid. 
And there were many judges, a minority of the judges, but quite a few judges. Many of them ended up on the Constitutional Court. Judge Didcock, Judge Ackerman, Judge Goldstone, uh, Judge, Judge Mohammed Ishmael Mohammed, uh, Judge Krikler. They were anti-apartheid judges who used the law against apartheid, but who, who said, I will take office even though I'm an apartheid judge. I can do more good against apartheid by being a judge. I think my own view, David, is that that was the right choice. There was only one judge who made a moral resignation. As you point out, that was Judge Laurie Ackerman. He resigned in 1987. He became an academic. But most lawyers thought that they should continue using the apartheid legal system. And the reason is an interesting legal system. When an ANC fighter was arrested and was put in jail, right until 1989, Peter Harris tells the story of one trial where four ANC fighters said, we don't want uh, legal representation because we don't recognize this legal system. Right until then, every ANC fighter said, I want a lawyer. And if there weren't lawyers to defend them, who would defend them? And they also said, we want a just judge. A judge is going to pass a just sentence, not pass the death penalty. So that was the choice. And the most important example, if I can just give one example, David, of the use of the legal system was the trade unions. The trade unions, until 1979, it was illegal, a criminal offense for a black person to join a trade union. 1979, the apartheid government realized they could no longer enforce the ban against black people joining trade unions. So they legalized black trade unions. Fasatu was founded a few years later from Fasatu, and then the trade unions decided to use the industrial court, use the legal system, and they became partners with the UDF a few years later in protesting against apartheid, using the law, and using the law to undermine apartheid. So that's a good instance of how the law was ultimately used for the demise of apartheid. These questions raise very interesting questions about the very nature of the law itself. So once again, putting my hat on as a law lecturer, I'm going to tell some people who, who haven't studied the law that there, there's, a, there's a school of thought called positivism that holds that whether law exists or not depends upon some social fact or norm which attests to the existence of the law. Natural law theorists, on the other hand, see there as being a necessary moral element to the law. And so, Edwin, a lot of these questions raise this kind of debate. Do you think there was law in apartheid South Africa? I, I think there was law for this reason, David, that apartheid's law never became a charade. Under Nazi Germany, the law became a charade because the judges did what they were instructed. They didn't give truthful judgments. As we see from the appellate division's judgments in, in, in the 1980s, uh, virtually abolishing the past laws, apartheid law had a serious just component. There was still enough justice under apartheid law. Apartheid was a, a wicked and unjust, pernicious system, but there was just enough justice under it for it to be recognized as a legal system. And that perhaps explains to some extent why um, you remark in the book in a very interesting passage that uh, South Africans, of course, were oppressed by the law in many ways, um, and yet entrusted our transition very much to a law and to the constitution and have a lot of faith in the law. And whenever we have a problem in our society, we often create a commission of inquiry or we find some way to focus our, our, our faith in the law. And so, what do you think explains the faith that South Africans place in the law? Well, it's, it's, it's very remarkable that when eventually F.W. de Klerk realized that they couldn't any longer continue trying to enforce apartheid, everyone agreed, the ANC, the PAC, the National Party, the Progressive Party opposition, everyone agreed that we had to have a Bill of Rights, we had to have a Supreme Constitution, we had to set aside. Everyone agreed there should be a Constitution. Very early on in the negotiating phase, by the end of 1991, everyone had agreed that we had to have a Constitution. It was partly as a result of geopolitical factors because of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of communism. The Communist Party was one of the strongest supporters of the, of, of the AIDS, the Communist Party of Russia, uh, which backed the Communist Party of South Africa. So one mustn't oversimplify the geopolitical factors that led to the transition in South Africa being a law-based one. But part of it was also the consequence of the fact that ordinary South Africans saw that the law wasn't only an oppressive instrument, law was also a source of potential justice. And everyone said, let's take the law. Instead of being used to oppress people, to strip them of their dignity, to take away rights, let's try to make a fresh start. And that fresh start is the Constitution. 
So coming from that point where we looked at a sort of apartheid history, you move in the next three chapters to go between your own very personal journey with HIV and the country's own journey in this regard. You speak very powerfully about illness and shame in the book. Why is there such a stigma around HIV? Well, it's still a terrific stigma. I think stigma is reduced because so many of us know people who have HIV or died of HIV. How many of us here know someone who's died of HIV? So many of us. It's terrible. We reach that stage that epidemiologists call a mature epidemic, where the grief of HIV is, is deeply within our families, our communities, our congregations. But there's still stigma. Even though we, so many of us know and we understand that HIV should not be condemned, there's still continuing stigma. I believe, David, that the source of the stigma is due to the sexual transmission. It's difficult to talk about sex. It's difficult to talk about the acts that lead to HIV transmission. People feel ashamed. They feel embarrassed about uh, the, 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 the condemnation. He shouldn't have had so many wives. He shouldn't have had so many lovers. She shouldn't have been unfaithful to her husband. He shouldn't be gay. We've got a thousand different ways of condemning people for the sexual acts that they perform, whatever they might be. And I think that the stigma is intimately connected with the fact that HIV is transmitted through sex. You speak movingly of the McGeary case, uh, dealing with a disclosure of uh, a particular individual, Barry McGeary's HIV status by a doctor on a golf course to fellow colleagues. Uh, tell us a little bit about this case, because it was, it was obviously one that was very close to your heart, and why it is very important for patient confidentiality to be upheld in this area. Barry McGeary was a young man who came to see me at the Centre for Applied Legal Studies at Bits, and he'd had an HIV test on the Monday, and his doctor had said to him, I've got terrible news for you, you're HIV positive. This was 1991. There was no treatment for HIV, so the news was like a death sentence. It was the same as when I got the news a few years before that I was living with HIV in the mid-1980s. And that Wednesday, Barry's doctor went to play golf with the town's dentist and with another doctor, Dr. Van Heerden and Dr. Foss. And in the course of his golf game, he said, do you know that Barry McGeary has got HIV? On Friday night, when Barry went to people, he knew that everyone in his circle knew that he was HIV positive. And he came to me and he said, I want to sue this doctor. I don't know who told, I don't know where the news came from, but we should sue him. We sued him, we lost in the High Court of Johannesburg, we won a very good judgment right at the end of the pre of the pre era, 1993, the appeal court gave a judgment in November 1993, a very rights-based judgment which looked forward to the constitutional era. Barry McGeary won. But unfortunately, by that stage, Barry himself had died. He died of AIDS in the course of the trial, but his point was a point about principle. Now, I want to say one thing, David. At that time, I was in the closet of my own HIV status. I hadn't spoken to almost anyone. When I fought Barry McGeary's case, only a very tiny number of my friends knew that I was living with HIV. My family knew, very few people, almost none of my colleagues knew. And that was because you couldn't do anything about HIV. You couldn't treat it. The only consequence of talking about HIV was probable discrimination and stigma. That was there. Now, we've got treatment. I'm on treatment, I've been on treatment for 17 years. We've got 2.6 million South Africans who are living today because of antiretroviral treatment. So now we can treat some. So I think the rules of testing, of treatment, and of confidentiality should be changed radically because now we can do something for someone with HIV. We don't say to someone, we're not going to talk about breast cancer, we're not going to talk about high blood pressure, we're not going to talk about diabetes, we're not going to talk about your other health problems, but we do it with HIV. And I say we should stop that exceptionalism. We should treat HIV like a normal condition. There's six million of us, ladies and gentlemen. The six million now come to your parents, and your brothers and sisters, and our neighbors, and our community members, and our congregants. This is not a strange thing. This is more than 10% of our country. We should normalize HIV. And that's what I think now. So, so just to push you on that, you, you feel that actually uh, 
there shouldn't be such a secrecy around HIV. There should be less secrecy and less of it to do. The patient must retain the confidentiality. If you diagnose with breast cancer and you choose to say, I'm not going to talk about it to anyone, that's your choice. You should retain that choice, but we should help patients to talk about their HIV. And I hope that there's a branch of the Treatment Action Campaign at UJ which, which, which advocates openness about HIV. The strange thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that we've got a lot of people who talk about their HIV status, but they're working class and poor South Africans, mostly black. Our political elite is completely silent about HIV. I'm the only person holding public office in our country who talks about his or her own HIV status. Even though we've got many other people who talk about HIV, and I think that's the right thing to do. It remains your choice, but it's such a wonderful thing to know that you aren't being condemned, that people support you and they love you, even though you've got HIV. It doesn't make a difference to the responses you get from people. And that's what we should be advocating. Not secrecy, but acceptance. So we uh, moved as a country, really, from a, a state of having a massive crisis as we transitioning. It seems also a little bit unfair, I always feel, that as South Africa was moving to democracy through a very difficult point, it landed up with a huge health crisis on its hands with HIV. And then, uh, and then uh, we moved to a point where, you know, the, the depths of despair in a way where the president himself was denying that HIV causes AIDS to a situation where we have one of the largest, if not the largest, treatment program in the world. Um, take us through a little bit about the country's journey uh, that you, 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 you deal with and also how the courts helped in that transition. Thank you, David. Uh, it was a terrible time for us. We, as, as we started negotiations to found our democracy, <coughs> our national prevalence was under 2%. By the time we became a democracy with a constitution in 1994, we had a national prevalence of 5%. So it was terrible. And it was quite clear that we were going to have a massive epidemic like the rest of Central and Southern Africa had. And it was very difficult for President Mandela and his government to deal with this. But the worst thing was five years later when President Mbeki took office. Almost immediately, he started signaling that he had a radical skepticism about the science of HIV. It was disastrous, it was calamitous, it cost many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of lives because Botswana started a national treatment program in 2001. We started ours only more than three years later, by which time many, many hundreds of thousands of South Africans had died and suffered completely unnecessarily. But the good thing in the story is that we had angry, ordinary South Africans in the townships, in the rural areas, in the suburbs, we had the Treatment Action Campaign, which was founded to tackle high drug prices. When I started taking my drugs, the drugs were fantastically expensive, people couldn't afford them. The Treatment Action Campaign tackled the drug companies and won that battle. The drug prices are now very low indeed. It's not, a, it's not the major factor. Then the Treatment Action Campaign had to turn its attention to President Mbeki, who refused to make the drugs that were now becoming so cheap. He said, no, I'm not going to make them available, and they took him to court. So we had a constitution that said you can speak your mind, you can organize, you've got freedom of association, you can march, you can express your views, we've got a free media, and we've got a right of access to court. The Treatment Action Campaign exercised all those rights, and the Constitutional Court gave a ruling that said to President Becky, you've got to start making these drugs available to people. And to President Mbeki's credit, David, this was the dramatic moment of our constitutional founding. Health Minister Matthew Chabalala Simana was asked on SABC television, will government listen to the court? And she said, no. The court must listen to government as well. We know better than the court on this issue. And the next night, Justice Minister Penny Maduna went onto television and he said, no, we're going to follow this judgment. President Becky was very reluctant. There were fits and starts and foot dragging, but eventually he followed the judgment. And that was the most important event for the rule of law, was when President Becky bowed his head to the law. And I credit him for that. So I want to move also to discussing one or two other features of the book, and I want to leave time for a little yes. bit of questions as well. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your own process of dealing with your own sexual orientation. And then related to that, you, 
you were very involved in having the sexual orientation clause um, actually placed in the, our constitution as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, South Africa is one of, I think it still might be the only con country in the world which has a, a constitutional clause prohibiting discrimination specifically on sexual orientation. Now we're obviously dealing with a very, very difficult and, and, and in some ways horrific environment at the moment that's developing within the African continent around gay and lesbian people and almost an attempt to uh, I see it as almost a type of genocidal attempt to do away with gay and lesbian people from a community or, or make it so difficult um, for gay and lesbian people to, uh, to, to live and live their lives ordinarily. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your own process as a personal side and then how that transformed into the political side of actually moving this clause into the constitution. Thank you, David. When, when I, when I realised that I could no longer deny my own humanity, which part of which is our sexuality, whether you're straight or gay or bisexual, is part of your humanity. It's like your skin colour. I'm proud to be white. Why? Not because white is better than black, but because it's the way I am. And it's the same with being gay. It's the way I am. If you're religious, you can believe that God made me that way. When I accepted that, I had to accept that we won't fight for gay and lesbian equality. So I was a human rights lawyer, I was an anti-apartheid lawyer, but I also campaigned for gay and lesbian equality. When we got the chance to negotiate between 1990 and 1994, we argued that we should have a wide equality clause, one that didn't only, at one point, the equality clause said race and gender. Then they said race, gender, and ethnicity. Race, gender, ethnicity, and language. And we said, throw it up, include everything. And the ANC and all the negotiating parties agreed to include sexual orientation in the clause. And that was the, the world first, as you say. You comment frequently about the gap between the constitutional vision and the reality of South African society. For instance, we now do have a promise of equality on grounds of sexual orientation, yet violence often besets lesbians and gays in the country. Did South Africa adopt a constitution that promises too much but can only deliver very little? And how do you think can the gap be addressed? I don't think we promised ourselves too much. We also promised ourselves dignity. We also promised ourselves equality. Our society has in some ways become more unequal because of the, the disparities in income distribution. We didn't promise too much. We are delivering too little. That is particularly the case with race discrimination, which still continues. Uh, I went to my old school, ladies and gentlemen, just a few weeks ago, and I was very shocked. I asked at the school, I said, how many of you have heard the K word used in the last few weeks? And almost half of that school put out their hands. Then I said to the black kids, I said, how many of you have had the K word used at you? And quite a few of them put out their hands, and I felt really shocked because I thought, how can this vile word of racial abuse still be used in our country? But that's the fact. We still have too much racism, too much gender oppression, too much stigma and discrimination against gays and lesbians. But we haven't, we do promise ourselves too much. The Constitution, when people say the Constitution means nothing because it hasn't achieved everything yet, I say, I say it hasn't achieved nothing, it hasn't achieved enough yet. But we must make it work better for us. And we also have to have a vision of what we want for the future. People often talk about transformation. That concept often means we, we need to look to what we were, but we also need to imagine. I, I ask students in the second year, imagine what kind of society do you want in South Africa? And a few of them actually wanted to commit themselves to that. And I, I invite our audience members to, to, to imagine a little bit. And one of the things that I imagine, and I'm sure you're not going to be surprised that I, I want to engage with, is some of your writing on socioeconomic rights. For, for, for some of the audience members who might not know, I've written a book on poverty and fundamental rights. Um, and uh, at one point... In which David criticises the Constitutional Court. <laughs> I, I do criticise the Constitutional Court very strongly. And interestingly enough, and to his credit, Justice Langer, who was the Chief Justice at the time, who, was, uh, who I fondly refer to as my judge, uh, because I worked for Justice Langer, uh, he wrote the foreword to the book. 
And one of the things he said was, um, although he didn't disagree with, he didn't agree with uh, some of the criticisms in the book, he said this is the kind of book we need because we need searching engagement with the constitutional order. And I thought that was always a, a really a, a, a wonderful approach and showed his his ability and his 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 views of the importance of dissent and engagement and argument. But on page 137, you came close to articulating a conception of social rights to which, with which I actually agree. You state that the final constitution enshrined rights to social and economic goods. The South African constitution explicitly acknowledges that it is impossible to enjoy right to equality, freedom of speech, religion, freedom of association without a minimum level of social benefit. You have to have education, social security, food, water, housing and healthcare to be able to enjoy other social rights. Close quote. Yet in the sixth chapter on socioeconomic rights, you defend the constitutional court's approach to socioeconomic rights, which ultimately refuses, in my view at least, to specify any content to these rights. The constitutional court, for the benefit of audience members, focuses on whether a government program is reasonable, okay? So whether it essentially can, can be justified, okay? And so from an entitlement to a minimum level of specific goods, the court has simply focused on the need for a justification. It hasn't said, I can claim anything specific from the court. And so the question I wanted to ask you is, how can we have rights in a constitution if we do not know what they allow individuals to claim? This is a hard question, though, to <laughs> But it's a very good question. And the answer, I think, that it lies in the nature of the rights. The rights, the constitution says you have a right not to housing, but a right of access to housing. And it says government mustn't realize that right today or tomorrow, but the government must take reasonable legislative and other measures in order to realize that right. So it's a progressive realization right, it's a gradual right, and it recognizes that we're all involved in the process of realizing those rights. Now, David's conceptual challenge is how can you make a reasonable assessment of government's housing program unless you know what the minimum is, unless you're measuring it against something. I differ from David's uh, criticism there. I think that we apply a reasonableness test in many areas of the law without some residual intrinsic conception of, of, of what the minimum of, of that reasonable conduct is. So I respectfully differ from David there, but I think the answer lies in the nature of the constitutional rights that they seem as progressively being realized, and therefore the courts and government are engaged in a process in order to realize them together. Now, you, you criticise the approach taken in Latin America, for instance, though very briefly. The Colombian Constitutional Court, in my view, has taken uh, a very sophisticated approach to socioeconomic rights in the world currently, and, and it has taken a number of steps. The first important step is access to courts. In South Africa, there have been relatively few cases on socioeconomic rights, if you actually have a look at our case law, partly because, I would argue, of the complexity of what the Constitutional Court requires. In Colombia, the court hears hundreds or if not thousands of actions per year, partly because there's an easy procedure in the constitution called a tutela, which essentially allows people to come to court quite quickly. You can write, you don't need a, a lawyer, you can write, a, I've been denied a medicine, I've been denied a housing, and then the judges have to look at your case if you've, been, if you've been denied a right, and they have to pronounce on your matter within 10 days. Most of this happens at the high court, but it can be appealed to the constitutional court level. Do you not think South Africa needs to ease its rules around access to courts? David, that's such a good question because I think it goes to the heart of the separation of powers. I think judges can do a lot. In the treatment action campaign case, the judges made a magnificent stand. They started South Africa on the road to rationality in dealing with AIDS. They started South Africa on the road to having the world's biggest publicly provided treatment program on ARVs. The judges can't do too much and shouldn't do too much. And I want to give you an example. When President Zuma came and became president in 2009, there were three demarcation areas. The one was here in Fong, the one was in Kokstan, Matatiela, and the third was in Mutsi, where communities said we're in the wrong province. We are very angry. You betrayed us, you gave us the wrong demarcation. And President Zuma said, I'm going to fix this. And he got a minister who subsequently tragically died, so he said, Sorry, my mouth is dry. <laughs> and he got him to go to these communities. But Merifon was fixed, Matatiela was dealt with in a different way, but the Mutsi community came to court. And they said to us, there's not been enough consultation. We don't want to be where we are. 
in northern province. We want to be in Mpumalanga. And they came to court and they argued their case saying that the government hadn't consulted them properly. And we sat on their case for months. We looked at the facts. We tried to find a way in which we could find for the beauty community and there was no way. And the day we gave judgment, the court was packed with people from Wootsie. It's about three and a half hours from here. Is anyone who knows where Wootsie is? It's a mainly super speaking area with the, the Nibeli speakers uh, close by to it as well. And they came, is there someone here? I, I was just looking for someone. But they came to court and we gave our judgment dismissing their action against the government. And we walked out of court and my law clerks came to me afterwards and they said the people in court were very angry with you. They said that the court has let them down. And I thought those people were wrong. It's not the court that let them down, it's their own elected leaders that let them down. And if the court is going to try to take responsibility for every failure of political leadership, for every failure of service delivery, the court's going to take on too much. People should be demanding accountable government, honest government, corrupt free government, accountable leadership that keeps its promises and promises are made. That's what I think. So for democracy to function, we need angry, informed, well-informed, critical citizens. And that's what we need. We don't need overactive judges. People, though, they feel somehow that when there's an intuitive lack of, of, of response from their elected leaders, when they feel that they are blocked through the elected channels, they, they want judges to respond in their favor. Now, again, to mention the Colombian court, um, the, there the government has often shown quite a lot of ineptitude. And the court has been seen to stand up in favor of citizens' rights. As a result, it's actually become one of the most legitimate institutions in the society. And its approval ratings, if you take kind of polls, are far beyond that of parliament. In our own context, this, the constitutional court's popular legitimacy, if Tiernus Roos' book is to be believed, is very low in the wider society. Although many of us amongst the more educated people will be very favorable towards the constitutional court, it, 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 it has a kind of low level of, uh, it's often not even on the radar screen of many people, but it also la lacks a lot of popular legitimacy. And cases like Mutsi and perhaps Mazibuko, where there were community movements around particular issues, and the judges dismiss those cases, that is quite harmful to the courts. And I, I worry about this, because I, do we not see in service delivery protests and unlawful actions a despondency that has set in around the law because of the constitutional court's refusal to engage more actively with people's socioeconomic rights interests? Do we not need judges to actively defend in a way, to, to bring the constitution to the people and for people to see that the constitution is responding to their needs if they are not to lose faith in the law? David, let's start off with your premise and I'll come to your question. The premise is that the law and the constitution and the constitutional court have a low regard amongst people. I dispute that. The, 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 I don't know what evidence Tiernus Rue brings, but I don't think there's been a proper survey of South Africans. The last survey done last year, where people, the Economist magazine said 46% of people mistrust South African courts. That was wrong. The survey asked about the administration of justice and it dealt with policemen, prosecutors, magistrates, it dealt with the administration of justice, anyone who was a law enforcement official. There's not yet been a survey that says what do you think of the constitution, what do you think of the constitutional court, the high court, the magistrates courts, what do you think of the police, the prosecution service. We haven't had that form of differentiated survey yet. My own experience is that the notion of constitutional agency is very widely disseminated in South Africa. And I believe that that's one of the strengths of our constitution, which is that people, even the service delivery protesters, people who compare the service delivery protesters to the Arab Spring are quite wrong. Because the service delivery protesters don't want government to be changed. They want government to change in what it's doing for them. So they are saying we want this government, but we want this government to deliver better for us. And you know what? I think they've almost always got a point. Because they understand that they're not getting the proper treatment. We're a developmental country. We're a developing country. We're not a poor country. There shouldn't be people living in abject poverty in our country. There shouldn't be people without the dreams. There shouldn't be people without basic uh, habitation. And the, and the people who are service protesting understand that our government should be doing better for them. So I don't think this is about the Constitution. I think this is about the responsiveness of government. And I think this should find other ways 
of, of, of exacting accountability and responsiveness from government. So we could discuss many of these issues uh, for, for a lot longer. I want to sort of allow the audience to exercise their rights of participatory democracy uh, quite soon. But I want you to just in conclusion, you state that it seems to me that the constitution remains the best part. South Africans have to create a just and ordered future for ourselves. A, a, a conclusion with which I agree. And perhaps in conclusion, I just thought you could elaborate upon why you think our society should continue to have faith in our constitution. Well, David, I, I, it's not just that I think we should continue to have faith in our constitution, it's that we should activate ourselves as UJ students, as congregants, as community members, as, as, as members of organizations, as members of political parties, as voting people. We should be activating our constitution more effectually. So I do believe it's, it's the best. It's the best feature of our transition. It's the most distinctive feature of our country. And the important thing about the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen, is that we've had it for 20 years. The values in it, no one disputes. The promises it makes, no one disputes. The structures within it, the separation of powers, the powers of the courts, the powers of parliament, the powers of the president, the basic constitutional settlement is not in dispute. That's not only in the political elite, it's more widely dispersed than that. So we've got a functioning instrument not functioning well enough, but a functioning instrument whose values and mechanisms are widely accepted and we should make it work better for us. We shouldn't write it off, we should make it work better. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a round of applause to us.